The little girl constantly complains of strange pain in her private parts. When her mother examines her, she discovers something terrible. Little Susanna, eight years old, was crying on her knees in the bathroom when her mother heard her crying and asked, "Susanna, what's wrong? Why are you crying, Mommy? My bottom hurts. Does your bottom hurt? Did someone hurt you, Mommy? It hurts a lot. I can't go to the bathroom, Honey. How long have you been like this? For several days. I didn't tell you because you're always busy." Lupe didn't wait any longer and took the little girl to the doctor as quickly as possible. She couldn't stop imagining the worst. When they arrived at the hospital, they had to wait a few minutes in the waiting room. Meanwhile, Lupe thought about Susanna's routine, trying to recall if there had been any oversight where an accident could have happened. Susanna was anxious and scared, so her mother said, "Susanna, how are you? Does your bottom still hurt? Whatever happened, it wasn't your fault. You can trust me. I need to know what happened." The little girl kept complaining of the pain and didn't answer any questions. So her mother, trying to calm her down, said, "The doctor will see you soon and will give you something to make the pain go away. Stay calm; it won't be long." After the wait, it was finally Susanna's turn to be seen. But by then, the little girl not only felt pain in her private parts but also had an annoying abdominal pain. The doctor proceeded to examine Susanna carefully. Hoping not to find anything serious, however, there were no signs of any significant injury. Still, the doctor called Lupe to speak with her privately and said, "Ma'am, it's crucial that you remain calm and provide us with all the details you have to uncover the truth. Our medical team is doing everything possible to find out what's happening to the little girl so we can help her in time. We are not here to judge anyone, but tell me, are you married? No, I'm not married." Do you have a partner? No, I'm not with anyone. Do you still live with your parents or share rent with someone else? No, I don't live with anyone else. The little girl and I live alone. There is no man in the household. Although occasionally we stay with some of my friends. I understand. Is it possible that the little girl was left alone with one of those friends? No, doctor. I haven't left my daughter alone with anyone. Do you have a job? Yes. I work as a domestic worker, and who looks after your daughter while you are working? The doctor insisted. I don't have the money to hire a babysitter. What I do is leave her food ready so she can stay alone. But, doctor, do you think someone may have harmed my little girl? I don't have anything to believe. Right now, the only thing that matters is what the tests reveal. The body gives enough signals to notice any warning signs in the exams. All I can do is trust in their work. Do whatever is necessary to uncover the truth, but to everyone's surprise, the tests revealed nothing. The little girl had no injuries. The doctor first examined her and, finding no problems, referred her to a pediatric gynecologist for another checkup. Even though the gynecologist performed X-rays and exams, nothing out of the ordinary was found. The hospital psychologists also got involved with the little girl, but found nothing concerning. However. The child needed to remain under observation until it was clear what was causing her so much pain. This is what the doctors indicated. Over the weekend, rumors spread among the nurses that perhaps the little girl was not being well cared for at home and might have a urinary infection. There was also talk about the possible partners Lupe might have had and how she might be responsible for her daughter's condition. The following Monday, Lupe went to the hospital and asked to speak with the person in charge to demand. He should explain what was happening to his daughter, who continued to suffer from severe pain without a known cause. The hospital director told her that his team had performed all possible tests, but the results showed everything was normal, and the only thing left was to wait for the pain to go away on its own. He also mentioned that it was not appropriate to prescribe any medication since the cause of the pain was still unknown. Well, if my daughter is fine, then I'll take her home. Your daughter cannot leave yet. She is not discharged. So when will she be discharged? The little girl has been in bed for days, crying from the pain. The team of doctors agrees that she should stay in the hospital for continued observation. If you take her out of here, you will need to sign a document ensuring that she will be under your care. And soon a local social worker might visit your home. My daughter has always been under my care and will continue to be.
They can visit my house as many times as they want, but let me take her out of here. Lupe proceeded to sign several documents presented by the doctors, giving her consent without reading them, making it clear that the little girl was no longer the hospital's responsibility and that she would be accountable for any issues her daughter might face. Lupe took her daughter home, but the little girl didn't sleep a wink all night. She lay on her stomach because she said that position relieved her abdominal pain. But now she also started feeling discomfort in her breasts and developed a fever. Unable to get a diagnosis from medical professionals, the mother decided to take her daughter to a well-known healer, hoping she might be able to cure her. The healer asked the mother and daughter to remove their shoes before entering her home to connect with Mother Earth. During the session, the healer began by playing strange drum music with women's voices shouting in the background. She then dimmed the lights and lit some candles, using them to burn herbs to cleanse the mother and daughter. The ritual began with the healer uttering some incomprehensible words. Mother Nature to intercede to improve little Susanna's health by cleansing any impurities that might be harming her. Then, she had them both hold a stone and think about their grandmothers, asking them to free them from any evil spirits harming the little girl. Later, the healer prepared an herbal tea and instructed Susanna to drink half of the remedy while asking for help. And then, when she needed to drink the second half, to gargle with it and spit it out as a way of cleansing herself. The little girl followed the healer's instructions. Now you can feel the bad spirits descending from your heart to your abdomen. You need to expel them from your body. Tell them they do not belong to you. They do not belong to my body. Now say it out loud. Tell them to leave. Get out, you do not belong to my body. Go away, I, Susanna, command you, excellent, keep going. The drum music grew louder and faster. An assistant of the healer began to smudge little Susanna again, and she started to scream with all her might. The healer began to clap and said, that's it, now shake your whole body. You need to clean the soles of your feet with these special leaves. Rest for three days, and if you feel pain again, you will need to come back for another herbal tea. The healer then began to sweep the entire body of the little girl with a bundle of herbs. At the end of the ceremony, mother and daughter went home. Tell me, my daughter, did the pain go away? No. Mommy, it still hurts, but I had a lot of fun at the ceremony. Then the little girl went to the bathroom and screamed in fright. It was the first time something like this had happened to her. Mommy, come help me quickly. The bad spirits are coming out. Upon entering the bathroom, the mother was met with a horrifying scene. The little girl had stained the toilet and her clothes with bright red liquid and was so scared that she had even wet herself. Lupe quickly grabbed the folder with her daughter's medical records and rushed her to another hospital. Entering through the emergency room at full speed, little Susanna kept saying that an evil spirit was coming out of her private parts and spoke about the healer. The doctors quickly notified the authorities to open an investigation against Lupe after several doctors observed the child. It was then the turn of an endocrinology specialist. She did not find any injuries on the child but called the mother to ask some questions. Hello, I am the doctor in charge of your daughter. Tell me about her daily life. Her daily life is like any other child her age. She goes to school every day and spends her afternoons at home. I don't have much to say. She usually doesn't wear makeup or act in ways advanced for her age. No, the child does not wear makeup, except on the rare occasions when she has dressed up for a school event. And what about her diet? She eats a balanced diet. Yes, she eats quite well. Can you tell me what is happening with my daughter? The child is experiencing early menarche, which is due to precocious puberty, which is very rare in an 8 years old child. Early menarche and precocious puberty. What does that mean? Early menarche is influenced by diets high in fats, exposure to inappropriate images for her age, light exposure, and substances like bisphenol A and phthalate that circulate in her body and accelerate puberty due to their effects on hormones. And now that I know all this, what should I do? What you need to do is take care of your daughter as you would any child her age. Society often exposes young children to precocious adolescence. We know you won't be with her all the time, but you must ensure that she remains away from these inappropriate stimuli. 
Lu Pei was left speechless upon hearing what the doctor had to say. But she was completely grateful to the health agents and to God for finally knowing her daughter's diagnosis. She would now take proper care of her so she would no longer suffer. After watching the first story above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. Now, let's watch another similar story. The day Emma's work as a train attendant changed irrevocably. She was 40 years old. Her work days had been boring and risk-free up to that point. Emma was calm, quiet, and shy. She was used to routine and had done a good job of handling the predictability of her work. But then something unexpected happened on one of her regular long-distance road trips between Chicago and San Francisco. Forcing her to face how wrong she had been about her capacity to manage unforeseen problems and maintain control over her life. Even the most prepared police officers would have been overwhelmed by what she found on that lonely 40-something train. Emma, much to her own amazement, was able to stop mayhem from engulfing her and the rest of the crew by knowing exactly what to do at the appropriate moment. It all started one cloudy, gloomy June morning. Emma was completely taken aback when she heard a baby's cry when the people took their seats. The doors closed, and the train began to move faster. Emma was in charge of keeping rigorous control over everything that transpired aboard the train. Second only to the captain who oversaw the command position at the front. Although Emma could assign certain chores to her co-workers, including keeping an eye on the compartments, she was well known for her strong sense of responsibility and always chose to complete things on her own. She had no idea that she would be faced with a challenge she had never encountered before, rescue a missing infant. Emma initially believed it could be an error and assumed the noise originated from a nearby compartment inhabited by families with kids. She was positive it was a baby, though, when she heard it again, just behind her and tucked away amid the last few seats of an empty carriage. An infant whose cries broke the stillness and who had no apparent caregiver. Emma grabbed up the infant and attempted to comfort her, whispering clumsily, shush, quiet honey, don't cry, don't cry. The girl was small, about five months old, gorgeous, with large blue eyes that, under different circumstances, would have made Emma want to cradle her and give her a gentle peck on the cheeks. However, the infant had a flushed, teary, and upset face. Emma didn't have time to ponder over the specifics. She had to move swiftly to keep things from getting out of control because she was holding what appeared to be a lost infant. Emma felt something behind the blanket that covered her when she comforted and cuddled the infant. She reached in gently and discovered a small, rumpled envelope with a letter inside. Emma felt her heart skip a beat and her world spin as she read the note. Please take good care of her, stated the statement. She doesn't deserve the life I can provide her. I truly apologize. This adorable infant is not worthy of me as her mother. Emma struggled to comprehend the note's contents and read it several times again. The message was very clear. Emma had no idea who the mother was or where to look for her because the girl's mother had abandoned her on the train. Emma couldn't help but notice that there was a string of seemingly random characters and numbers beneath the text. Adding to the mystery surrounding the scenario, it occurred to her instantly that it might be an encrypted message. It's not possible. What the heck am I going to do now? God? This infant requires her parents. I had to report what happened to the captain right away. Emma declared, clutching the infant to her bosom in a hopeless attempt to soothe her. This is very serious. Emma had never felt anything like this before. She was momentarily helpless and didn't know what to do. Because she had always been self-assured and resolute in her work. She was trusted by all. But sometimes, even the most seasoned pros can feel lost. And Emma was feeling lost. She was terrified but she controlled herself by asking for assistance and making an effort to remain composed. She proceeded to the front compartment, where the train master was stationed, to apprise him of the situation and initiate a backup plan. The train master swiftly contacted the station from which they had departed after hearing the information, reporting the baby's abduction and requesting that they study the security tape from the morning in order to locate the mother who had boarded the train and left the infant unattended. The train master tried to help the searchers out by giving as many facts as he could, including the baby's sex, 
clothing, and the enigmatic message of abandonment, as well as the baby's approximate age, and the cardboard box where Emma had discovered her. A big group of station officials responded to the train's message by calling the police and making arrangements for rapid medical aid when they got back to the station. The authorities were unable to quickly locate the mother of the child. It didn't help clear up any questions about the infant and made it plain that locating his or her family would be no picnic. It felt like an eternity passed with no resolution in sight. The likelihood of finding the baby's family decreased with every passing minute as the train had been gone from the station for more than two hours. The longer the infant was cut off from society, the harder it was to find out where she came from and who had left her on the train. While waiting for reports from the station headquarters, Emma and the train crew faced an increasingly precarious scenario. As concerned passengers took turns calming the infant, the train master chose to relay the terrible news to the entire crew via the loudspeaker. Emma, who had been there for the infant from the beginning, providing comfort and reassurance, found this transparency to be a relief. Nevertheless, the most difficult parts were still ahead. Emma was caught off guard by what happened because she lacked childcare experience and had never dealt with infants or children before. The infant started sweating profusely as the hours went by, which worried Emma. She felt more and more helpless when she asked other passengers, many of whom were parents, for aid because she didn't know how to assist. Even worse, they didn't know what to do about the baby's requirements. The baby's obvious symptoms of disease made the situation much more critical. She was clearly in the midst of a critical illness, as her condition appeared to be fast worsening and her cries became more frequent and intense. Emma found it difficult to make sense of what was happening because her medical expertise was limited and out of date. As the baby's temperature continued to climb, her face took on a concerning shade of purple. Immediate medical attention was obviously necessary. Emma cried out in a state of desperate need. This child needs to be seen by a doctor as soon as possible. In an effort to get assistance, is a medical professional present on this train? Someone with medical training should come forward immediately. This infant need urgent medical attention due to a severe illness. As Emma saw the infant begin to babble and eventually pass out, she let out a desperate cry. Even though a lot of people came running over to try her soothe the baby and figure out what was wrong. Nobody was able to determine what was causing the fever and pain. Additionally, no doctor could be located despite the staff's best efforts to search each carriage for someone qualified to examine the infant. Sorry Emma, but we're all by ourselves. A troubled and frightened friend of hers expressed the need to wait until they reached a city with a hospital. Which is still more than an hour away. The baby's condition was visibly deteriorating, and the companion's distress was palpable. The flight attendant had never done this before and was terrified of doing it. But she would not hesitate to do it when the time came because Emma and the baby couldn't wait any longer. The situation was about to get much worse. Nothing about the infant or her alleged mother could be found at the station. The mother seemed to have vanished amidst the throng of people passing over the station. Since the station was crowded with visitors and families checking out with baggage on Saturday. One of the first weekends of summer vacations, it was almost hard to spot anyone acting suspiciously. The only certainty they had since discovering the baby was that the mother had purposefully left her daughter on that train and understood how to evade security when the situation worsened. Everyone was quite concerned about the baby's severe situation because of her high fever, which was making it difficult for her to breathe. Emma's thoughts of the kid dying in her arms filled her with anxiety, tiredness, and fear. A few times the baby convulsed, a little at first, then more forcefully. Emma experienced a palpitation of her heart. One of the passengers helping her exclaimed, she needs help, she's gone into shock. We must begin first aid immediately, every minute matters. Emma had undergone basic medical training during her onboarding. Just like the other members of the train crew, she was trained in first aid for both adults and children but she had never really treated a real person, much less in such dire need. Emma had to move immediately because the baby was in danger of dying. Thus there was no time to waste. Please move aside, I need room. Emma yelled at the bystanders. She put the infant down gently on a table and started CPR with a sense of urgency mixed with fear. 
A terrifying few moments it was. Emma wasn't sure if she would be successful since the baby kept convulsing till her breathing ceased. Still, Emma persisted, resolved to use every ounce of her strength to save the kid. Fortunately, the baby's vitals stabilized and her breathing gradually returned after a stressful minute during which everyone feared the worst. She had been saved by Emma, but it was a band-aid solution. As soon as possible, they had to get her to a hospital. We'll arrive there in under 60 minutes. Could you please hang on? Fearful at the thought of how near they had come to a catastrophe. Emma's supervisor inquired, I'm not sure, I really hope so. With tears in her eyes, Emma replied, We can only monitor her blood pressure and provide air with this artificial respiration bag. Her voice was tinged with regret, not just any life, but the life of a sick and defenseless baby, who had been ruthlessly abandoned by someone who knew better. This was the life that she had just saved. Emma experienced a mixture of relief and shock. Who could commit an act of such atrocity? That is the kind of mother who, as they traveled on, she considered the desperation that could lead someone to commit such an act. When they eventually reached the train station, an ambulance and a medical team were there to help. The girl was expeditiously cared to by the paramedics. She is really ill. I had to provide CPR in an emergency. She has a high fever and is having trouble breathing. After hurrying the infant to the hospital, Emma said to the paramedic, I don't know what's wrong with her. Almost passing out. Before anybody else, Emma gave a statement to the authorities, detailing how she had discovered the infant and presenting them with the enigmatic note that had been with her. To me, this message holds the answer to the riddle. Emma told the police officers questioning her that the parents of the infant would be located if they could read it. This time, Emma's gut feeling was right on. The note included the first name Kirsten and GPS information. According to the police investigation team, Within 30 minutes of their current position, the coordinates indicated a palliative care center. The baby's disappearance and the circumstances for her train abandonment were already shrouded in mystery before this finding. But they took the hint and went to the center to find out for sure. The infant was transferred to the intensive care unit of the hospital as the police investigation was continuing. She was diagnosed with acute malnutrition and a significant respiratory ailment after doctors performed tests and treatments. After much effort, the medical staff was able to stabilize her condition. Emma never left the baby's side the whole time. She established an intense bond with the little child whose life she had spared a few hours earlier in her role as flight attendant. The medical professionals at the facility attempted to identify the infant using a battery of tests but their databases turned up no pertinent results. This would indicate that the mother was either not a citizen of the United States or that the delivery had not taken place in a medical facility. Until she knew who the parents were and why they had left her, Emma would not budge from her goal of staying with the kid. The police found something far more terrible than anyone had expected, but luckily Emma didn't have to wait long for answers. Police were taken aback when they visited the palliative care institution mentioned in the note. Kirsten, the Orlando-based aunt of the child, was uncovered. Sophie gave birth to her daughter Anna at home five months ago. Which is why her name isn't in any registry. The baby's name is Anna. As a family of refugees who had only been in the nation for a year, Sophie and her family's predicament was more complicated than everyone had anticipated. The reason Sophie left her daughter on the train was the most unexpected revelation. There were just weeks left to live for the 24 years old. While she was pregnant, she found out she had a rare and impossible blood malignancy. She decided to go through the pregnancy untreated so she wouldn't hurt the baby. But it really made her illness worse and her symptoms deteriorate faster. Her predicament went unnoticed by her sister and the child's presumed father who was in Ukraine because of the conflict, hoping Anna could have a family. Sophie, in her desperation, decided to leave a message for her daughter leading the police to her sister. Doctors at the facility told the authorities that Sophie, who was medicated to control her discomfort, would not be able to speak freely, even if there might have been other ways to grant her daughter's last wish, a better future than she could provide. That was her only wish. After getting all the facts, 
The police decided to end the investigation and let the right people decide on Anna's custody. To completely recuperate from his respiratory condition and regain his strength, he would still have to spend a few more weeks in the hospital. In keeping with her mother's wishes, Emma stayed by little Anna's side during her whole hospital stay. Eventually, it was time to say farewell and transfer her care to her family. A poignant tale that shows how short life is and how critical it is to talk to those we care about and get help before it's too late came to a sad but satisfying close. After watching the stories above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. If you enjoyed our video, please like, subscribe, and share our channel. That all about today's stories. See you next time.